So before we talk about what you've actually done, um, maybe just set this report up for us. What are we going to see? Well, um, we're going to see some videos that the um, mother and the girls have been sending me. Since our first story aired on the 10th of February, I've kept in regular contact with them and they've also kept in contact with me, continuously updating me as to what their situation is and their plight. And they became like friends for me. Um, so in anticipation for their release, I've put together uh, this little package. Um, let's take a look, shall we? Okay. Hello, ENCA. This is Noor. Uh, please help us get out of Syria. Uh, we are uh, stuck uh, in here in uh, Jobar and in Tarman. We had to leave uh, our uh, homes. Uh, please, uh, South Africa and Mr. Nelson Mandela, help us. Last Thursday, ENCA received a desperate plea for help from Wotan Guta. We don't want to die. Uh, we want to go to school and li to live and uh, to play. Now we are hidden in SLR. Please help us. Meet Syria's youngest war correspondents. Assad regime has brought most of his forces to destroy Ghouta. The people can defend themselves. Noor and her eight-year-old sister, Alla, often braved the streets to give the world a window into their lives. <laughs> After their home was bombed, Noor, Alla and their families went on the run, caught between merciless airstrikes and rebel groups fighting back. I'm still alive. Last night we couldn't sleep because of work. Their mother, Shamza Al Khatib, maintained close contact with ENCA. Please, Larissa, do something for us. We are dying. We are facing the days every minute. And all children here under fires. ENCA, together with South Africa's Gift of the Givers team in Syria, began planning a rescue operation. Gift of the Givers then enlisted the help of civilian bomb squad response team, the White Helmets. Hello, how are you? Have you fine? Yes, I uh, speak with her and maybe today or tomorrow we'll reach. Everything is uh, ready. We received her. Don't worry about that. I talk with, uh, also with the uh, White Helmets uh, to arrange everything with her. The White Helmets is a team of 3,000 civilian volunteers situated across Syria. Its mandate is to provide emergency response to any and everyone wounded in the attacks. The girls and their families have now been rescued and removed from the war zone. The Al Khatibs are safe for now, but their future remains uncertain. With seemingly no end in sight to the bombings, they can never return home. But they've promised to keep the cameras rolling and to keep the world well informed about the real victims of Syria's war. Narissa Subramani, Johannesburg. All right, back live with us on the uh, Newsday set. So let's rewind if we can. And I think let me just try and put some context to all of this. This is quite an astonishing story because what it does, it gives a local and very personal angle to a conflict that is so many thousands, hundreds of thousands of kilometers away from us, but and often people are unaware of exactly what is happening and some of the atrocities that are being committed. And uh, through the eyes of these two little girls, we're able to get a first-hand look at uh, exactly what is happening and the, and the horrors uh, regarding this conflict. So let's rewind if we can. Um, how did you initially make contact with this family? Well, we were working a weekend and uh, ENCA received uh, a tip off that these girls are on Twitter and we managed to get their contact details. And since the first story ran on the 10th of February, I've been in regular contact with their mother. Um, and this is from the time they've been in Ghouta. What was your first point of contact? Do you remember what happened then? I sent her a WhatsApp because I got her number on WhatsApp and I asked her, I introduced myself and I said I'm from a local channel in 
South Africa. Probably not expecting a response even. No, yeah. I wasn't actually. Uh, when she did respond, then I asked her, look, uh, can you maybe send us um, a video for ENCA uh, just telling us what's going on? Kind of, because that's what these girls have been doing. They've been, they're the youngest, I think, war correspondents in that country. And they're doing things that, I mean, reporters uh, and journalists are not able to. Explain to us exactly what they've been doing, Narissa. Well, look, they've been taking their phone outside after all the bombings, even during the bombings, and filming what's going on and tweeting these videos. And since then, we managed to get some of these videos from Twitter. We've aired it on our channel. And um, like I said from the first story on the, f on the 10th of February, I have not stopped talking to them and their mother. It's a thing like every single night. Um, I found myself, I, I did break rule number one. I got emotionally involved. And it, what was terrifying for me was um, waking up one morning and finding out that the worst had happened. So um, I, I also don't know how much. Uh, when you say the worst had happened? That they were dead. I was terrified of waking up and finding mm. out that they were dead. Um, so I, I, I would contact the mother regularly and I had even at one point asked her to please just every morning send me a message to, that I know that you're safe and in the afternoon. And this friendship between the two of us had had begun um, we talked a lot about both our children and it was amazing they were stuck on in hell on earth but they used to ask me about my family how we're doing and um, I, I didn't know how where else to turn I mean how do you how do you help in a situation like this and the only person I know in South Africa that has experience in this is MTR Suleiman from the gift of the givers. Let's pause there we yes. can get to what MTR Suleiman said a, a little bit yes. later but um, why do you think the story affected you so much? Well I'll answer that question with a question Jeremy you're a parent mm. so you'll know why this affected me mm. so much because these are two little girls they should be in school they should be talking about I don't know, One Direction, but they're here and they're talking to us about a war in Syria. Narissa, what do we know of them? Well, we know that they, uh, they haven't been able to go to school. They come out regularly saying that their school has been bombed, their neighborhood has been besieged. That's a constant narrative that you hear from these girls, that we don't have basics like food, water, medicine. In a few, uh, few of the attacks, I believe the younger girl, Ella, Well, um, it, it just so happened the way it played out, the UN Security Council had negotiated uh, a ceasefire, so which means there couldn't be any bombings that were happening. So in that three or four days, Gift of the Givers managed to get a team inside Ghouta and make contact with uh, Shamza Nur. Do we know how they did that? In, in, in amidst all of this chaos, that must have been particularly difficult to do. It was, because, I mean, I'm contacting MTS. MTS is then contacting people on the ground to get teams from northern Syria to get into Ghouta. And I gave them the number for uh, Shamza, the mother, and they've been in contact since. And I believe since then, Shamza has also been a point of contact for the gift of the givers um, for people inside Ghouta that need assistance. So they also know how to get to these people. Um, and then, of course, we started working on uh, their, their home was bombed and we covered that on this channel as well uh, when they lost their home um, so after that they've been on the run and while they've been on the run it's been absolutely harrowing because every single day there's been a desperate plea from their mother please can you help us get out of here we are in a moment as soon as it's ready going to play a little excerpt of the interview I did with Dr. Imtia Suleiman from Gift of the Givers um, and uh, my team will tell me when when we're ready to do that but uh, at some point then in the last 12 to 24 hours there was a break in the story yes there was. What happened then? Pick that up for me. Okay, so in order to leave Ghouta, um, Syrians have to apply to the Assad regime uh, for them to get onto the buses that I believe um, is over, like the, the whole process um, Russia oversees. So you're given a number. When your number is called, you pack all your things and you get onto this bus. So in that time, they managed to get on the bus. But, Jeremy, this has been extremely dangerous because even though um, we've, we've organized this rescue mission, they, the, 
it was uh, the onus was on the family to get onto that bus and to get to a city um, in Hama where the gift of the givers would meet them. But from there till Hama, they were on their own. And the concern was that these girls have now. Uh, you know, attained a high profile on Twitter. They've been um, receiving the likes or they've been receiving the attention of the likes of like Alyssa Milano, Amnesty International, and they've been a very vital part of documenting what's actually going on on the ground in Syria. So the fear was that at checkpoints that are set up by the Azad mm. regime, these girls will be discovered and their identities revealed and the worst could happen. You and I are both going to take a deep breath because the next question I'm going to put to you is how you felt the moment you heard that that story had broken and while we're reflecting on that let's return very quickly then to the interview that I conducted with uh, Dr. Imtia Suleiman from the uh, gift of the givers just a short time ago and this is how the news broke on the channel you can see from the tweets they send out and from the communication with them they are very strong-minded uh, people, you know, both the lady Shams and even the kids, the, the small kid Noor, at that age, very strong-minded, strong will, very clear of what they want, very clear of what they've seen, very clear of the circumstances inside Gota and all of Syria, and or they're very pleased that they're coming to safety. But it was very sad when we spoke to her two days ago. She spoke to Anas Alhamati, was the you know the guy the Yemeni guy who took Koki out here uh, you the Koki out from Yemen and they told him you know what all our life we've only lived in Ghouta we don't know any life outside outside Ghouta we don't know any family outside Ghouta where are we going to go to where are we going to stay who are we going to be with what are we going to do so Anas tells her right now safety and security is paramount get out of Ghouta and we will make the arrangements for you and try to have as many other people as possible and you know be fine you'll be fine you'll be safe and she's ecstatic now that we followed up on our promise that a driver met her in Ghouta I mean in, in Hama and they're on the way to the hospital so on their way to the hospital at Hama so when that story started breaking this is the culmination of uh, a lot of work that you invested into it um, sense of relief I imagine so much <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so much. Like I said, um, it was, it's emotional involvement. These are girls. I have a daughter myself. So the fact that they are safe and they would gift of the givers and now we know where they are. I, I just wanted at least two girls, and, and, and I frequently speak to their mother about this, let's be positive, let's picture a life for them where they are normal girls, they're playing outside, they're going to school. And Listening to One Direction. <laughs> listening to One Direction <laughs> and Justin Bieber, let, let's, you know, be positive about this. So when the story broke and when I received the message that they were safe and I got that video that we've been playing, just, just relief washing over me that they are finally safe. I think tonight I can also get a good night's sleep because I also check my phone. Journalists, we have this habit, uh, like every, you know, hour my sleep breaks, I check the phone. Have I heard from Shamza? Until I get that voice note that says we're fine then I can like it's a sigh of relief temporarily but then what's going to follow tonight is not going to be like that I think we're all going to get a good night's sleep tonight when are you going to talk to them um, well we're waiting for them to get to the uh, hospital and from there you will be the first to talk to them actually the whole family um, so as soon as that is set up and as soon as um, they get to the hospital this channel will hear from them and the whole family personally so you will be the first, Jeremy. <laughs> Proud of you, Nerissa. It's a difficult story. It is. Thank okay, you've you. been very strong. Thank you.